Father, I thank you so much for loving us. I thank you that we can come into your presence this morning, Father, through your Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that you would, in a mighty way, move in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives today, Father, to draw us closer to yourself. And Father, as we uh, come with an attitude of praise and worship today, Father, I pray that you would accept our praise because we love you. We thank you for loving us, Father, like you do, unconditionally. I pray, Father, that, uh, I pray for our pastor today, Father, as he brings your word to us. I help him to uh, speak boldly, Father, through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, we have the privilege this morning of beginning our uh, worship service with a powerful and special testimony as uh, a young man comes before his church family to proclaim the decision that he has made in his life to ask Jesus to be his personal Lord and Savior. So we uh, invite you to join us in this time of worship as we celebrate uh, this decision. And as he gives testimony, we want to encourage you to consider your relationship with Jesus as well. What would bless him the most this day is if you're here this morning and don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that his testimony would encourage you to pursue Jesus and come to know him better. All right? not any easier for him than it is for any of the rest of us to get before a big crowd of people like you, and you're kind of scary to us here, <laughs> to a young boy. So, uh, but I do want to encourage you to consider your relationship with Jesus this morning. That's what Emmett would want you to do, and uh, whether or not you have followed in believing baptism as well. All right? Mike, let's worship together. Let's stand as we sing, Oh, Worship the King. Psalm 136 reminds us, and the song we're about to sing uh, also does too. It says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let's sing that together.
are people who tend to have a short memory. We, we forget uh, things uh, quite often, especially when it comes to the goodness of God, the things that he does for us. Um, you know, we've just passed the Easter season uh, several months back. That one is a good, that season is a good reminder of us, uh, Palm Sunday and Easter, of what Christ has done for us on the cross. But this, so- this song also reminds us, um, has a phrase into it, I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. You know, we don't know. You know, we, we, we just know what the Bible says Christ has done for us. But we'll never die on the cross ourselves. So we won't ever know about that. But we know that Christ's love has done that for us. This song is a good reminder of bringing our worship to God because of all the things that he's done for us. Let's sing together. Father, we pray especially for Emmett this morning as he starts his new life with you. We pray that you will guide him daily, keep him in love with you throughout his life. We thank you for this time of worship that we have, the opportunity to give back to you a portion of what we take in to further your kingdom's work. We pray your blessings upon it. We pray especially for Willie's sermon this morning as he opens the book and brings us your word. We pray for the working of the Holy Spirit that he may, if need be, lead someone to make a decision to follow you. Thank you for Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. that uh, I think you'll know, so if you know them, please feel uh, free to sing along with us.
morning, I have a confession for you. I have uh, been dealing and trying to work through the things that are happening in our society and our nation over the past several weeks. And I tend to be someone who takes or at least tries to be positive and hopeful in the face of any circumstance. But I have been tested. And I have been tried. And as Johnny Cash would say, maybe found wanting a little bit. It's not only in relation to Supreme Court rulings or shootings or even the religious war going on in our world that have me on edge. It's also the response that I have experienced from self-proclaimed Christians on both both on the, the social media level and even in person that have me a little off kilter. I apologize for that because it it uh, well, it's distracting to life. It's difficult situations that we're living in, difficult times. I know my scripture well enough to know that end times will come, and there is nothing. Let me repeat that: there is nothing we can do to change that. I've read the end of the book. I know how it goes. I understand that in end times we're going to experience some horrific things. And there's nothing that can change that. This is not one of those prophecies that God gave with an if. You know, for Nineveh there was an if. Jonah came and and told them that they were displeasing God. And that because of the way they were living, God would rain down fire and brimstone upon them and destroy them. Jonah actually looked forward to it. Now that was a problem on Jonah's part. But that didn't happen. Because that prophecy was told with the intention of of impacting the Ninevites. And it did. From the top down, the one in charge of the whole city stopped and called all of his people together and he tore his clothes and he said, we have sinned against God Almighty and we must repent. And you know the rest of the story. God forgave them. But when we read of the end times, see, this this isn't a prophecy about trying to call people's or God's people back to Himself. The prophecies of the end times are about exactly that the end of what we know. And so, 
They can't be changed. It's going to happen. However, as a Christian, I have a responsibility to press on toward the goal to which I have been called heavenward. It doesn't matter whether the end times are thousands of years away or tomorrow. The call on my life as a Christian is the same. To bring glory to God by being a revelation to the world of who He is. Pointing people to Him. So how do I do that? How do I hang on to the hope that has been given to me in end times? And I'm not saying, please hear me, I'm, I'm not giving you any predictions, okay? I'm smarter than that. Anybody who gives you a prediction, just walk away. Smile and wave and walk away. How many times have we heard it? How many times have we been given a date when Armageddon is going to come upon us? When the end times are here? The only thing I know for certain is every one of those dates is wrong. Because that's what my Bible tells me. No one knows the time. So I am not here to tell you that I know when it's coming. Because I don't. I hope and I pray that I don't have to go through a lot of the things that I read in the book of Revelation or in the book of Isaiah about end times. I hope and I pray that my children don't have to go through that. You know, it, it's kind of hard for me as we sometimes do. We, we say, well, Jesus, come quickly. And uh, I know that what lies ahead after this life will be so much better. But that doesn't mean I have to be in a hurry to get there. I'll wait on God's timing. But how do we handle it now? Whether these are the end times or these are just more of the birth pains of what's coming, it really doesn't matter, does it? See, whether my life ends tomorrow or whether my life ends 30 years from now, the call God has given me is the same. Oh, it's, it's interesting to stop and think from time to time. If you, were, if you were told you only have 48 hours to live, what would you do? And sometimes we think, well, we ought to be living that way all the time. Well, I don't know about that. Because there are some things you, you might want to do. If you've only got 48 hours to live, there's some things that may not matter much, but you want to get an experience. You know, some people create a bucket list for the end of their lives, before their life is over. But we do need to be living fully and completely. And so I wanted... I wanted to share with you what God shared with me throughout this week. I hope and I pray and I expect that what God has shared with me is what He desires to share with you all. The reason I say that this morning, a little bit different than some other mornings, is because this is what God gave me specifically for me this week. This deals with where I'm at. But I believe he also wanted me to share it with you. So if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to open them to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4. We're familiar with Peter. Especially during the time Jesus walked the earth. We're familiar with how Peter was good at sticking his foot in his mouth. How he would show himself strong in one minute and then just blow it the next. And so I don't know about you, but it's not hard to identify with him. Because I'm not perfect. I stumble and fall. 
But God picks me up and dusts me off and says, let's get back at it. Just like he did Peter. Peter grew in his maturity and understanding of God in great ways. And in this second, or first letter, I'm sorry, in this first letter that Peter has written, in chapter 4, he shares with us a little bit of what I have been dealing with. Beginning in verse 7, if you'll follow along. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. So that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion Forever and ever. Amen. I believe in this passage, Peter has told me how to do this. How to live. So the question we're looking at this morning is, how then shall we live? How then shall we live? I want to draw your attention to four things that Peter shares with us in this passage. But before I get to the first one, I want to make sure we are clear. As much as we may think we're in the end times, Peter wrote this a long, long, long time ago. And the first thing he says here in the passage we looked at, The end of all things is near. One thing I know to be true, it's nearer now than it was then. How much nearer? I don't even make an educated guess. On such things there really is no educated guess. But I know we are for sure at least experiencing the birth pains that Jesus talked about. So how then shall we live? Number one, with purpose of prayer. With purpose of prayer. Now you may look at that statement and say, well, of course we have purpose behind our prayers. Because I want God to do this, and I want God to do this, and I want Him to take care of that, and I want Him to watch over this. Absolutely we pray with purpose. Well, there's a little bit more to it than that. See, prayer is truly our conversation with God. It is a time when we sit down and have that one-to-one with God Almighty. What is the purpose of conversation? Have you ever thought about that? The purpose of conversation... Why do you talk to someone? Well, some of you do because it's just your personality and you can't stop. And we love you for it. But in reality, we communicate to try and get another person to understand our thoughts. Now that will work out well if we truly understand that prayer is communication and communication is a two-way street. And we need to listen as well as speak. Because if we understand that, then communication, prayer with God, helps us to understand where He's coming from. What He has determined and planned 
and intends. See, I can watch you from a distance. I can watch your actions. I can watch the things you do. And I can make a judgment on what you believe. And a lot of times, I'm pretty good at that. Not because I have learned how to be good at that, but because one of the gifts that God has given me is discernment. It's not always a great gift to have. Because the tendency is I can also tell when people are doing things out of false motives. When they say, well, I'm doing this because I love you. No, you're not. <laughs> Sometimes we don't, even though we say it. But when, when, we, when we listen to God's heart, when we're in communication with Him, we learn about His intentions. Purpose of prayer especially in times like these. Was it God's will that Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar come in and take over Israel and take the people of God into captivity out of their nation and take over their territory? Is that God's will? Yes, it was. That's what God needed to have happen because his people had begun ignoring him and turning to other gods. He needed to get their attention. He needed to draw them back into his presence. And even when he did so, even the prophecies that said this is coming included this is coming and it will last for a time and God will restore you. And he did. You know, one of the things that... that people often struggle with when we talk about situations like this is do you realize the price that Nebuchadnezzar had to pay you see each one of those kings or rulers that came in by God's plan and conquered Israel and took God's people captive by God's plan you know each one of those was punished for their action because it was still against God's people, and that is not acceptable to God. Even though God used them in that way. We struggle with that a little bit. Let go of it. Don't worry about it. God designed it. God made the rules. God made the decisions. And it's all okay. So that means even with us, leaders that are put in position of leadership over us. God allows them to come into leadership for his purpose and plans. And he uses them, but they will be held accountable. He will hold them accountable. And so in times like this, when we talk about purpose of prayer, there's, there's two aspects to this that, that we really need to grasp. The first is... We need to have sound judgment. And that comes from this prayer. If we engage God in conversation, we understand what God is trying to accomplish in the circumstances around us. We need to have sound judgment. Part of that also is we need to recognize the enemy for who the enemy is. When there's a miscommunication in your family and a fight and a conflict break out, Whose fault is it? Men, please don't point to your wives. Whose fault is it? See, too often, we look at those we're in conflict with, and we say, you are the problem. When for those of us walking with Christ... We have got to realize there is one and only one who intends to seek you out, to kill and destroy you, to lie to you, to deceive you, and to point you in the wrong direction. There is only one. Now, he may use a variety of tools and resources that allow them to use him, which may be another person, but it is still the one who has the intent to do you grave harm.
Do you remember when you were a teenager? Those of you who have been. Do you remember when you were a teenager and someone made a comment or you heard second hand of a comment that was made about you that just hurt? And suddenly that person is put at a distance and you don't want to have anything to do with them. Now, it may well have been a miscommunication that you found out years later. Or it may have been a misquote. Or it may have been a third party just trying to disrupt the relationship. But too often, we just put our arm out and say, no more. We need to recognize in the situation that we are in, through purpose of prayer of exactly what God is doing right now in our midst. What He intends to do, what He desires to do, and how He desires us to respond. That's what sound judgment is, and it comes from being purposeful in our prayer. You want to know what's going on? Ask God. It's not that hard. He does not want to keep us in the dark. Remember, He's the light. He wants us to understand what's going on. The second aspect of this purpose of prayer is a sober spirit. A sober spirit. Let me read a passage to you out of Luke chapter 21. Verses 34 through 36. It says, be on guard so that your hearts will not be weighted down with dissipation and drunkenness and worries of life. And that day will not come on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who dwell on the face of the earth. But keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of God. That's what I've had to deal with over the last few weeks in my own life. Is holding on to the hope and the purpose and the intention that God has for me, that God has for us as a church family, that God has for this nation. To hold on to that. Because God hasn't given up on us. God has not let go of you. And He will not. You have got to be of sober spirit and understand exactly what's going on with the circumstances around you. The second point I want to draw out from this passage of Scripture, how we then shall live, is love one another. Well, doesn't that go without saying? Not very well. To love one another. What does that mean? What does it mean to love one another? What does it mean to love God? Well, you know, loving one another, actually for me, loving God is much easier because Scripture tells me, He who it is that keeps my commandments, he it is that loves me, and I will love him and will make myself known to him. Being obedient to what God has called me to do is how I love my God. Now, loving you is another story. But I do. We do it in different ways, don't we? Sometimes we don't always communicate it well. Because again, we don't have the, as we talked about a minute ago, we don't use the two-way conversation. Couples, you want to love each other a little bit better. If you haven't read it, I would encourage you to read Gary Smalley's Five Love Languages. Because you see, our tendency is when I love someone else, I take the great commandment. Not only to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, but the second, which is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And we take that and we say, well, we're supposed to love each other. Do unto others as as I would have them do unto me. Well, you know, we've talked about that before. What I like, but that may not be what you like. Me doing for you what I want somebody to do for me doesn't work. You know, if it did, 
I'd come over and weed your garden. Because boy, does my garden need weeded. And would that show love to me? Please don't. Okay? That was not a call for you to come and weed my garden. It was an illustration. (laughs) We've got to know each other. And when we talk about loving one another, (coughs) the words Peter uses here, one of the words is fervently. To love one another fervently, with passion. I'm not talking about love. I'm talking about commitment love. I'm talking about caring so much about the other person that you're willing to give of yourself, that you're willing to sacrifice yourself for that person. You're willing to give up of your time for their benefit, even though you know you have no time to give up. That's what fervent love looks like. And in times like this, what we need, I guess the song was right, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. If the world could only understand what love was, then that would be true. (laughs) but the second aspect that comes from loving one another is forgiving it says love covers a multitude of sins that does not mean that just love a little bit and it makes up for all the wrong things that you've done it means when you truly love one another you will have the desire to avoid sin to run away from it Let me, let me make one side clarification that, that I've, I had to deal with this week. doesn't necessarily fit directly in here, but it applies. When we talk about sin, when you are tempted, what does the Bible tell you to do? Flee. Run. Get away. But one of the things that we have mistakenly done is, when the devil comes against you, what are you supposed to do? See, the Bible doesn't tell you to flee and run. Actually, what the Bible tells you to do is resist. Resist the devil. And he will do the fleeing. Our problem is sometimes we, we took that temptation mode, that sin mode, and we said, well, tem- we, we need to run from temptation. So when Satan comes, we need to run. And we've been running for about the past 50 years. And look where it's gotten us. It's time for us to resist a little bit. That's part of love. Love is not always easy. Those of you who are in a marriage, you know this. Sometimes it's tough. Those of you who have raised teenagers, you absolutely know this. Sometimes love is tough. And what are you going to do? Are you going to give in so everybody feels good? Or are you going to stand on what is right and true and just? Love stands. Love does not cave. Love does not compromise. Oh, that's one of the favorite words right now. Love does not compromise. If something is right, then hold to it. Okay, I'll step off my soapbox for a minute. Love one another by forgiving means we restore and we forgive by love. The whole intention of forgiveness is restoration. Someone has done you wrong and you forgive them, but you leave the relationship where it was because they did you wrong, you didn't forgive them because restoration didn't happen. I mean, Jesus died on the cross for you. You receive that. But he doesn't change anything about you. That wouldn't work. And that's not the way he works. And that's not the way we're supposed to. Number three. How then shall we live? Hospitably. We should live hospitably. Now, being hospitable is not always that difficult. 
It's a little hard when someone comes unannounced to your home for a visit and you haven't had time to make your house look like a good housekeeping picture that everything is perfect. Let me tell you, or ask you, how many of you live in the perfect house that is always clean and never has anything out of place? That's not life. Your house is made to be lived in. I understand that. If I show up at your house and knock on your door to visit with you, I don't care if you've got a laundry basket of clothes that just came out of the dryer. That's part of life. Ladies, I love you, but get over it. I mean, you don't think I've got dirty clothes? Now, odds are you're not going to see them very often because my wife is the same way. You know, when someone's coming over and it's been a busy week, I can't get to the clothes in my closet because of the Laundry basket stacked up in there. Don't tell her I told you that. (laughs) But what, what Peter says here is we're supposed to be interacting without complaint. Now, suddenly there's a condition thrown on hospitality. Yes, there is. God desires us, especially in times like this, to be hospitable to one another without complaint. Galatians 6.10 tells us to do good to all people, especially the family of believers. But it says to all people. Why? Do you know what people are looking for right now? Do you know what we don't have In our secular society right now? Do you know what people want more than anything else right now? They want hope. They want to see someone living with hope. So that they might be able to have hope. And that's what I've been struggling with. Over the past couple weeks. Is holding on to that hope. And I realize something, especially in my position as the under-shepherd of God's church here, is that if I lose hold of that hope, it's going to have a detrimental effect on all of you as well. And I can't do that. And God will not allow that. And I thank Him for taking me where He took me this week to realize that. Because if I get up here and I start talking about how horrible it all is, which it is, but don't hold on and and hold out that hope for you to see, then we all become downcast and downtrodden. And that's not God's desire. See, of all people in this community... It is the family here at First Baptist Church that has been called to give them an opportunity to experience hope. Even in the midst of these circumstances that we're living in currently. Here's the truth of the matter. Persecution of the family of God will increase As the end time draws near. And Peter said it. Close to a couple thousand years ago. What did he say? The end of all things is near. So we've got to be ready and equipped to deal with. The persecution that we will experience. And the way we do that is we have that attitude of hospitality, being hospitable. Number four, 
Serve one another. Serve one another. Any of you who have willingly served someone else, gone out of your way, especially willing to sacrifice for someone else, you know the rewards that that can bring. Notice I didn't say will bring. I said can bring. It doesn't always. Sometimes it gets you from behind. You go and do a nice thing, do a good deed, and you get hit from the back of the head. Sometimes that will happen. But don't let that stop you. Because the benefits in the long run will far outweigh whatever cost may come of serving one another. But there's another qualification here. When you serve one another, you need to do it with purpose. And Peter tells us, the reason we serve is to glorify God. We serve to glorify God. Even in the midst of what we are experiencing, God can still be glorified through our lives. Even in the midst of a people, a nation, who is turned away from God, God can still be glorified through you and I in this nation. And He desires to be. But it's by how we live to serve one another. Willing to serve. What do you do when you see trouble? Do you run away? Or do you run toward it? Well, it depends upon the trouble. And it should depend upon the trouble. You may not be equipped to take care of the situation. And it may draw you in instead of you helping the situation. You may need to step away. But many of us need to recognize that where trouble is, there are people who are hurting and need help. And we are called to be servants. Jesus came to serve. When he got down on his knees and he washed his disciples' feet, he served them. Have you ever had your feet washed by someone else? It is not a comfortable thing. I mean, I know some of you well enough. There is absolutely no way you would let someone else wash your feet. I have a hard time, but I recognize that sometimes we need to allow others to serve us too, because that's what God has called them to do. And for me to refuse is for me to rebel against God Almighty himself. We're a family here, and if you're in need, let people serve you. You don't have it all together. As much as you want to and as much as you may put up that front, none of us has it all together, including me and especially me. All we do is to glorify God. And so in situations and circumstances like we are living in right now, we must ask the question, what do we need to do? How are we going to glorify God, to live out our hope in times such as these? Well, we need to live with purpose of prayer. We need to live loving one another. We need to live being hospitable. And we need to live serving one another. Why? Because it will change the world. If we will press on with these in mind, our current circumstances will not dissuade our hope. And that's what I hope you will join with me in trying to do. Because I don't do very well when I start looking at my circumstances and I let hope begin to decrease. Life doesn't work as well. 
I need the hope that God has given us through his son, Jesus. I know the end times are coming, but that doesn't mean I throw my hands up and say, come, Lord, we're, we, we see you're coming, so we'll just stop. That's not an option. It's a little too reminiscent of of the uh, football coach at the University of Tulsa when I was down there and we played University of Oklahoma. Locker room before the game, he, he gives his pep talk. Well, let's go out there and don't embarrass us too much. That was his pep, that, that literally. It was like, there's no hope for you to win this game, so just don't embarrass us too much, all right? Let's go. That's not an option for us, folks. We're ambassadors for the one and only kingdom that will last for eternity. We're the ambassadors for the kingdom that has the answers to every problem anyone in this world has ever or will ever face. We're the ambassadors who bring hope to a lost and dying world. And the circumstances around us will not dissuade us from holding tightly to that hope and giving it to others. Now is the time when this nation is ripe for revival. Now is the time when people are looking Oh, you may think, well, look at where we are. Nobody cares. Oh, they care. And they would love for what we believe to be true. They just aren't seeing it yet. And in times like this is the best time for that to be revealed through us. Hold on to the hope. Hold tightly. Let's pray. Father God, right now, We pray that your hope will endure in us, that it will be lived out in us every single day, and that it will spill out as a cup that runs over in our lives, that the hope that you have instilled in us will be so strong and so present right now that it will just spill out on everyone we come in contact with, and they'll even look at us a little funny because the hope we have in you. But Lord, we also know that it will draw them closer to you as well. That you will use us in times such as this to transform the world. Jesus, when you came, you turned the world upside down. The children of Israel couldn't fathom what was going on. And so many of them missed you. Because you turned the world upside down. Well, our world has been turned back over. And we need you to turn it upside down again. Beginning with us. May your hope reside in us. And may we keep our eyes focused on you. Right now, Lord, I pray for many who are here this morning that may not know you as their personal Lord and Savior. And they have no hope. Lord, they hope what I have said today is true. They desire it to be true. But Lord, they haven't experienced it yet, and it's time. It's time for your spirit to call them out, to make a decision to accept the price that was paid on the cross by your son Jesus, to pay for their sins, that they will have hope of life abundant and life eternal. And so, Lord, give them strength right now to make that decision as Emmett testified today about making in his life that he prayed and he asked Jesus to come into his life to forgive his sins and to be his Lord and his Savior. And we rejoice with that decision that Emmett made. And Lord, today we want to rejoice with others who are ready to make that decision also. Father, for some who are here that recently have prayed and asked Jesus to be their Lord and Savior. But they haven't quite worked up the courage to step into those baptismal waters yet. Give them the courage to make that testimony. 
The water's there and it'll be there next week too. Lord, are, are you calling some to follow in believers' baptism? And then, Lord, also call out to each and every one of us. Help us to know how important it is that we're a part of the family here. There are some who have been coming for a while and they consider this home as far as churches go. But, Lord, they've never stood up and been identified as a part of the family here. And it's time for them to come and join the church family and be identified as a member here. Because we need each other. You put us together for a purpose. So give them the courage to step out and come identify with the family of God here and with what you're doing in this community. Lord, there are other decisions that people are dealing with right now in this moment. In fact, there are decisions right at this instant people are contemplating in their mind of what they should do. Help them to seek you out. Maybe they need to come and talk with someone. Maybe they just need to come up here and pray for a minute. To get serious about making a decision. Whatever it is, Lord, call us out now. Call us quickly and give us the courage to respond to you as we praise and worship you right now. It's in Jesus name we pray.